Hello, everybody, and welcome to Next. Good afternoon. Just a quick introduction. We're to, here to talk to you about BigQuery and John Lewis's journey into BigQuery. Uh, I'm Christian Ashby. I'm a customer engineer with Google Cloud. I'm joined by Tom from John Lewis Business Intelligence and Corey, who's a technical account manager with Google. So what we're going to cover today is some business trends that Google sees generally in the marketplace, our customers and other enterprises are seeing how those trends apply to John Lewis and their partnership and their journey modernizing their data into cloud. And I want to put, uh, sorry, bring Tom back to bring some success stories from their journey so far. So I want to look at some trends in data analytics now. And generally, we see customers and enterprises globally are struggling to keep up with what we call digital natives. We see increasing demands for new insights and definite pace in analytics and the requirements for analytics. We see huge demand for volume and for capacity, a bit more on volume later. And we see a legacy in the enterprise of a number of different platforms and data silos. And of course, on everybody's lips today is the question of enterprise security. Um, with different regulatory compliance requirements coming in, GDPR, et cetera, um, pretty much every business needs to think about security in new ways on a regular basis. So who in the audience, quick show of hands, who thinks these ring true for you? Good, most of you, which is what I'd hoped. So we're on the right track at least. Um, so we talked about volume of data. So the sheer volume of data that's handled globally by IT in general is growing hugely. By 2025, the IDC reckons that the data sphere in the world will grow to 175 zettabytes. I had to look up what a zettabyte was, 10 to the 21 bytes or a trillion gigabytes. That's quite a lot of hard drives. Um, and moving on from there, thinking about how digital disrupts retail. Every CEO is trying to change and is trying to change to uh, meet the priorities of any business. They've got to look at shareholder value and profitability. They've got to think about ac acquiring and retaining valuable customers. And it's an increasingly challenging labor market. They need to think about how to invest in employees and invest in obtaining new employees and new expertise for their business. And those priorities are borne out in these data uh, points that we observe on the move to a digital first business. If we can achieve some of these impressive statistics, how do we actually help businesses go on that journey to start to deliver some of these numbers that we see there? So faced with these challenges, every business is trying to implement change. And data warehousing, et cetera, is one of those key parts of any enterprise change. But how do we stop your data warehouse becoming a data skip? Right? All your data, garbage in, garbage out, doesn't help anybody. And existing technology and legacy applications can fall down when they're faced with the sheer volume of data that we talked about. Now, as you've probably seen from the rest of this conference and your experience with Google in general, our approach with compute and our entire platform is to provide elastic scalability and full management. Um, and that provides accelerated adoption and makes sure that ease of use across the platform is as good as it can be. And our data platform is no exception to this. BigQuery and all of our other data environments provide fully managed, continuously scalable platforms on which to run your data management. Combined with advanced analytics, GCP broadens the reach of that data analytics. And the intention there is that you don't need expert data scientists to do the mundane data analytics tasks anymore. If we can democratize those tasks to everybody in the business, you can get to insight faster, and you can use your data then with more value, use those data scientists to generate more value for the business. So what is BigQuery? We've talked about it a lot already. It's an enterprise data platform. It's based on a columnar database, and it can scale from zero to petabytes as needed. Like everything Google Cloud, it's encrypted by default, and it's resilient to enterprise standards. It's a true no-ops serverless platform, and it can deal with both real-time streaming and batch data. 
It has built-in capabilities for machine learning within the confines of a friendly industry standard SQL interface. So you don't need to learn R, you don't need to learn the complex machine learning languages, et cetera, to get some insights out of your data using ML. And increasingly and more recently, it has in-memory capabilities to improve your visualization and BI pipelines. And BigQuery sits as part of the overall data platform on Google Cloud, providing storage and analytics capabilities. That's part of this whole ecosystem from capture, processing, and at the other end in visualizing and prediction. So enough about Google Cloud. Um, I want to pass you over now to Tom Lomax from John Lewis, who's going to talk to you a bit about the journey that John Lewis have gone on to facilitate data across their business. So I hope you can all hear me all right, and I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, my name's Tom Lomax. I head up the data engineering team uh, in the John Lewis Partnership. Uh, so my team are the team that are responsible for migrating our data from a lot of our legacy systems into the cloud. Uh, I'm going to talk really around three things this afternoon. Uh, why is retail such a challenging environment right now? Uh, the, what are the tech issues that we're facing, and how is Google Cloud Platform and BigQuery really helping us on that? Uh, and then I'm going to give some insights into some exciting projects where we're using uh, GCP and BigQuery. So I'm hoping that you are all already uh, customers of Waitrose and the John Lewis partnership. Uh, can I just see a quick kind of show of hands? Who is a, a Waitrose or a John Lewis customer in the audience? Brilliant. That's really, really good. And who has seen the Christmas advert with Excitable Edgar? That's brilliant. If you haven't, I'm sure you will definitely see it probably many, many times between uh, now and Christmas Day. For those of you who are less familiar with our brands, uh, John Lewis is our department store, general merchandise department store, and Waitrose is our food grocer. Um, and it's a brand that's really propositioned around service, uh, and Waitrose is a, is a high-end grocer with a high-end food product proposition. So Andy McInnes, uh, our chief technology officer, spoke in the keynote this morning, so I hope you've already seen him once today. Um, and he talked about that the John Lewis partnership started as an industrial uh, experiment in democracy and the fact that we are all partners in the John Lewis partnership, which means that we all have kind of skin in the game as a business. And, and we really kind of care about that innovative approach to how we do things. So for the last 20 years, these two brands, Waitrose and John Lewis, have really operated as two divisional propositions. Um, and that means that the data strategy that's been in the business has really been linked towards these two brands. Now, you can imagine from a data point of view what that has meant. And it meant that we've got data in lots of different silos across the business in these two, two directorates or two parts of the organization. Now imagine the guy who has to join all that up. I'm that guy. So linking back to Christian's point around digital disruption, it continues to be absolutely massive in retail at the moment. Uh, but John Lewis is, is not behind the times from a digital perspective. Um, the John Lewis website is one of the most popular trading general merchandise websites in the UK. And waitress.com, our grocery website, is in month-on-month -month growth uh, continually for the last few years. A real example of how the business is listening to our customers and taking, uh, using the, the data that we gather around customers and innovating in what we do is around new customer propositions. And so actually, if you visit either our Waitrose shops or our John Lewis shops, you will start to see a real crossover of the brands and a crossover of the propositions in the coming months. So yesterday in Southampton on the south coast of the UK, we launched one of our uh, new concept stores in, in the John Lewis in Southampton. And there's lots of different propositions that are on sale and lots of Waitrose propositions. So for example, the Waitrose Cookery School is now being promoted within the John Lewis brand. And John Lewis products are being sold within the Waitrose brand. And again, that creates a whole new subtlety around how you trade data across the organizations with uh, different product information or pricing information, all those things that need to be considered. But it all it, it comes from about uh, knowing our customers better. So, UK retail or UK um, the high street, um, it has changed massively in the last 150 years. But some things actually remain relatively consistent. So if I take you back in time, 150 years, to do your grocery shopping, you would have made a list. You would have gone to the grocers or the grocery shop, which would probably be a corner shop or a small local store. You would hand over your list of the things, the food products you, you wanted to buy. Somebody would then shop those products for you. 
and then they would probably be given give to you in a bag or they would be delivered to you on a bicycle. Skip forward 150 years, it's not that different. You make a list probably on your computer, you hit submit, and then somebody delivers your groceries for you uh, the next day or the next morning, just probably not on a bicycle. But in some places, maybe on a bicycle. Um, so the first half of 2019 saw um, some huge shifts. So in the first half of 2019, 2,868 uh, British stores actually closed. And so we can see a real shift um, in how the high street is performing. Uh, that's driven by price wars and, and, and the competition in food grocery and the margin being significantly different. It's also a massive change into the online proposition. Um, and some of these are the fact that, so for example, the high rate of returns in apparel um, is something that's really changing the balance of, of uh, how people buy fashion. And some of the brands that have really suffered, and the reason that we need to be absolutely top of our game on this, are some are like Mothercare, Karen Millen, Jack Wills, Barstore, Patisserie Valerie, Debenhams, are all brands that have gone into administration this year, and that's why we're doing things very, very differently. So how do you set yourself apart in tough times on the high street? Well, this, uh, using the data we have to personalize our products and our proposition, as I've just mentioned, uh, predicting what customers want to buy before they even think that they know they want to buy it, curating the range and the assortment of products, and then using real-time marketing and data to actually uh, advertise that product to people at just the right time when you think they're going to buy it. And a lot of that comes from joining up the data from the offline world and the online world. And what we've really realized is actually it's using the same customer base across our two brands is where we've got huge opportunity to grow. So our data challenge, coming back to my point a little earlier on around our two brands that we have in the business, we have four major data silos in our business that, that we're actually trying to join up using uh, the Google Cloud and BigQuery. Waitrose data, which includes waitrose.com. John Lewis data, including johnlewis.com. Our customer data, which we've always kept somewhere slightly different, and our financial data. And we have a collection of hybrid of uh, on-premise systems, cloud systems, uh, from a variety of, of data warehousing vendors uh, that we've put in place over the last kind of decade or so. So why we have thought about going to, to Google uh, and to GCP is really around some of the same reasons I expect you're thinking about doing the same. So actually, how, without a, a huge investment in refreshing our legacy systems, our legacy platform, you can jump to the cloud and see some huge efficiencies. So part of the reason we actually uh, chose Google and moved to Google was around our long and existing relationship with Google. Actually, JL, the John Lewis partnership has been one of the biggest G Suite customers for a number of years. And in 2014, uh, we went live with G Suite. Um, really scaled that and actually rolled that to all 80,000 uh, employees of our business in 2017. And since then, we've seen the real digital uh, growth into digital and into GCP. So this slide represents a, an extremely high level, uh, what we're calling the partnerships data platform. And it really uh, shows a number of key uh, Google products. And we have a principle about if there's a Google product or a, a blue hexagon, as I call it, we should be our go-to uh, first place to look for a capability. But we're looking to uh, ingest the data, store the data, conform it, analyze it, and then visualize it, ideally using uh, a Google suite of products. What this doesn't show and what will come in time, and this is a journey for us, and we're, we're at the beginning of that journey, uh, there will probably be other products from other vendors that will probably um, be augmented onto this, uh, this diagram as well at a later point. Now, I'd like to hand over to Corey to talk a little bit more about our journey so far. Thanks, Thanks Tom. My name's Corey. I'm a technical account manager. I've been working with John Lewis Partnership for the last two years, and I get the fun part here, which is to talk through the how. How we're helping John Lewis move from, as Tom mentioned, a siloed, fragmented organization into a centralized, democratized, data-driven company. So before we dive into the migration framework and the program we're using, I just want to take a step back and cover some of the basics, because these are so important to any successful data warehouse transformation. So first and foremost, use agile delivery principles. 
these are, by very definition, long and complicated programs. Warehouses are complicated beasts, which on Lewis, you know, we've got half a dozen different data silos we're working with. These are systems that have been built organically over the years. Uh, and <laughs> full disclosure, sometimes we don't even know where some of these data, where, where the data is sourced and where it comes from. So if you have to build a team structure that's able to be responsive and react to those changes, the changes will happen along the way. But with that in mind, you also have to define KPIs and agree with your stakeholders what some of your key, uh, what some of the measurements and what some of the milestones are. Because really, you, know, you need to keep returning to those throughout the migrations. And as we go through this framework, this will help to, um, to inform some of the business decisions that happen with your migrations along the way. So there's two main areas, business and technical drivers. So from a business perspective, you think about things like value generated from your data, cost savings. Maybe you're going to be decommissioning some, uh, some legacy systems, um, saving on li uh, license costs, et cetera. And from a technical perspective, maybe you're looking at you know, query speed, response time, um, concurrency of users that are able to access the data that you're trying to, uh, trying to exploit. Um, or system availability. So those are all great metrics you can establish up front. The third principle is really setting that governance for a wider adoption in your business. And like Tom said, you know, we're, we're on a journey here. We've built the platform. We're now onboarding more and more systems, more and more users into this platform. And we operate a sort of paved roads principle where you know, we have some established design patterns and blueprints um, that developers can come to and, and use, um, be able to use as they come on the platform. Uh, that's not to say we don't balance the best practices with developers' choice. So you know, if there's um, functionality or tooling that's not available, we can run a proof of concept or a spike and then maybe incorporate that back into some of the established design patterns. So once you have these three fundamentals in place, then it's really on to picking a good first mover for a proof of concept. And that's when the data warehouse uh, migration framework comes into play. And to be honest, this isn't rocket science here. This isn't the first time you've seen discover, plan, migrate, and have a validation loop in here. Um, but we are going to go just kind of walk through some of the steps and how we've used this to apply to some of the uh, John Lewis migrations. So first under prepare and discovery. This is where you identify use cases. And we define a use case as the, the, the schema, the data, the pipelines, and visualization tools for an end-to-end -end business process. So like Tom mentioned, we have a number of silos. We will look within one of those systems, start identifying those use cases. Um, and at this point, you also need to understand those non-functional requirements that go with, uh, go with those use cases. So is there a requirement for data freshness? Is there a requirement for concurrency of users? <laughs> what are your security requirements? That's always one that uh, is important to keep in mind up front. And then you can start, as you identify those use cases, modeling the underlying dependencies and, uh, and interdependencies there. Once you've got those um, use cases and dependencies modeled, you can also start calculating a, a rough total cost of ownership. So really understanding, back to those KPIs, what is the business value and what, is the, uh, what are the, the technical milestones that you're trying to, uh, trying to meet. And it's really important, and I fall guilty of this as much as anyone else, we're not migrating for migrating's sake. It's very easy to say, well, what's the point of this program? Oh, we're going to take this data, and we're going to put it in the cloud. Then magic's going to happen, and it's going to fix, fix everything. You know, it's like, no, we're, we're looking at underlying business cases. So that is really crucial to keep in mind when you're establishing the value of the migration. And then keep returning to that. You'll see this over and over again through these steps. So then you move into assessing and planning. So having done that discovery work, this is where you prioritize your sprint backlog. 
uh, and really sort of a, a sprint and iteration kind of breaks down all these use cases will probably go across multiple sprints. Um, there's a few different ways you can prioritize these. And with, with John Lewis, we had an early, um, early migration opportunity. So we were able to sort of exploit an opportunity where we had a on-premise system that was due for license renewal. And rather than renew that support contract, we opted to use that as a first candidate to migrate to cloud. Probably one of the key things for a good first mover is taking a, a workload that is, that is known. Um, so you know, the, some, some of these legacy workloads, it, they're complicated. They've probably grown organically. You, know, you, you, you may not know as much about them. Uh, this was one that had actually been recently developed. We were able to, uh, to, to move it in its entirety uh, up front. Um, also important to take a sort of less risky one, because you're going to be learning as you go along. And it's very important for these um, uh, to, to leave time to allow for these learnings along the way. So you've prioritized your backlog. then. Go back to those KPIs and refine them for success. So understanding within that sprint, what is the definition of done? So what are the checkpoints for testing, for integration, for everyone's least favorite four-letter word, docs? That's part of the definition of done for these. So understanding what those, those KPIs and those metrics are. Uh, and also, at this stage as well, it's really important to identify, um, do you have the skills in your team to deliver this change? And do you need to get, engage a partner? And th that partner could be someone else within your organization that has that skill set. Or it could be an external partner to work with. And we'll uh, talk about some of the partners we've worked with, with at John Lewis. Partnership with a uppercase P, lowercase P. It all gets very confusing with partners and John Lewis partners. But so then you get to the actual migration path. And there's two main forks in the road here. So there's migrate offload or doing a full migration. So under a migrate offload, um, it's, really an, um, it's really around leaving the, uh, oh, sorry. So migrate offload is where you leave a hybrid solution in place, where you still have that legacy platform there, um, but you're still running additional capacity out of the cloud. And this is where, when you're establishing those KPIs, understanding why you're migrating. So if this is a system that maybe has been capacity constrained and is really complicated and you don't quite know what's in that can of worms and you don't want to open that yet, well, you can move some of the some of the use cases into cloud, and get those running, um, and then address some of the others. Uh, we call this within John Lewis strangulating a system, where you're going to take pieces of it and continue to run in the legacy system, but then spin up that capacity in cloud to run other pieces. A migration full is pretty much what it sounds like. So it's a big bang decommission of a legacy warehouse. So. Uh, case in point for the first migration we did um, onto the partnership data platform, we, uh, we wanted to decommission the on-premise system. So we brought everything across in one bang, and, uh, and we're running out of the, uh, the new partnership data platform. So regardless of if you're doing migrate offload or migrate full, it's a similar set of steps involved. So you will build out any new blueprints, any new design patterns. If you need to run a spike on something or a proof of concept to really understand, um, you know, is this a viable solution, you'll, you'll build that out. You'll migrate the schema and historical data. And that's a step that can take anywhere from minutes to months. And if you've got multiple petabytes of data, it may take you months to migrate that data across. So, once that data is there, then you can open up the platform to your data science teams, your data analysts, and have them start optimizing their queries. Uh, particularly if your landing zone is BigQuery, uh, there's some tuning, and there's a few sessions that are available over the next two days around tuning and optimizing for BigQuery. Really suggest you take advantage of some of those features with 
partitioning, clustering, nested tables, et cetera. So you've got the data. You've optimized the queries. Then you move the downstream applications, so any of the visualization tools, migrate the data pipelines, and then you move into that verify and validate loop. And finally, just want to talk a little bit about some of our partner network, as I mentioned. You know, if you don't have this, this experience and expertise in-house, we have a wide array of partners. A lot of them are here uh, today. Have a talk with them. I um, want to give a call out to some of the partners we've worked with, with John Lewis Partnership. So we've got Apps Broker team involved. We've got Datatonic, Reply on the data side. Um, Deloitte and Equal Experts have been heavily involved on the e-commerce side. And, uh, and yeah, they've been really, really great in helping John Lewis. So I want to hand back to Tom to talk about some of the success stories we've had. Thank you, Corey. So I am going to talk specifically about two GCP BigQuery success stories. Uh, both, uh, I've chosen them both because I think they deliver value fast for our organization. And we've delivered them as proof of concepts, and then we've iterated them on into actually more fully fed solutions. So both are quite large transactional data sets for us. A lot of, business, a lot of uh, information on our uh, business is transactional data. Um, and really what we were doing is we were quickly joining up those data sets, applying uh, analytics, machine learning, and then making it an elastic uh, model. So the first example I'd like to talk about is about joining up online and in-store data. Uh, this was sales data in Waitrose, so customer data, what people have bought in the Waitrose shops, and what they have shopped online in Waitrose. Uh, for us, this is two quite big disparate data sets. Uh, it was combining that data, feeding it into analytics, and then using it for um, segmentation and, and advertising reasons. Now, spoiler alert, this will be talked about in more detail at a session this afternoon uh, in this room at 4.15 by my colleagues Guy and Andy, who I think are in the audience. So if you can put your hands up, Guy is here, and Andy is over here. So I'm not going to talk about that one in, in super detail, because I know that they will talk, well, they will feel bad if I steal their thunder, and I know they will probably talk about it in a, in a probably richer level of detail. So, so do come along and join that session. But in summary, it worked. And uh, what took weeks to process data is now refreshed daily. So it's a big success story. So the other example I wanted to talk about is a more complex one, and it is the John Lewis brand propensity model. Um, so this is a bigger, uh, similarly, a bigger set and a historical set of John Lewis transactional data. Uh, and it's used to build complex pro propensity models uh, across multiple brands and multiple categories to understand what people have bought and what is the likelihood that they will buy another brand in the future. So in collaboration with Datatonic, which was a company that Corey just mentioned, one of our partners, uh, it was used to develop a machine learning pipeline on the Google Cloud platform capable of uh, generating multiple propensity models for millions of customers in a scalable way. So previously, this was a slow and very resource-hungry uh, process. Um, and by working with that partner, we've identified ways to massively, massively speed that up. Um, it's also uh, something that is scalable across different categories. So it was built for one part of the John Lewis business, and actually it's now easy to reapply that for another part of the John Lewis business. So as I said, it used machine learning models. This is a quite a simple um, aggregation of how the, 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 the Google tools or the GCP tools that we used. Um, but it really has allowed us to generate massive insight and then uh, to do um, direct messaging to customers about the brands that we think that they are most likely to buy next. So yeah, as I said on this one, similarly, what took normally about two weeks to run a model for one brand, uh, now we can run the same thing in, in a matter of hours for thousands of brands. So it is from where we were previously to where we are now, kind of a massive, massive leap forward in, in capability and scalability. So we're sco scoping um, more wholesale data migrations across the whole of the John Lewis partnership. Uh, those four big silos of data that I talked about are on that journey for us around migrating uh, all of that data warehouse into, into the cloud. So 
I'm going to now touch on some points about if you're planning uh, a GCP migration, what you might want to think about, and some of the learnings that we've had in the last uh, year or six months or so, and, and how we've overcome some of these. So we really did work with proof of concepts. And we did that deliberately to try and uh, demonstrate value and deliver value quickly to the business. So whether it's um, migrating a small set of data to do some analytics or to join that up with some other sets of data, I would highly recommend that you, you do some proof of concepts and you think about how you're going to do that first and really think about the outcomes and the benefits that you want to achieve. The next one is around um, understanding your customers. So who needs to consume this data? Is it the data scientists? Is it analysts in the business? How are you going surf it, to surface it to them? So if it's out of BigQuery, are you going to actually make BigQuery directly to available, available to them, which is something that you might not have done previously? Are you going to allow people to access it through um, something like Google's Data Studio? Are you going to allow them to access it through the, the, the Sheets connector directly into BigQuery? So really think about how you want them to access the data and whether you want them to be doing the work in BigQuery and using the machine, uh, the analytics engine in BigQuery, or whether you want them to actually just be a consumer of that data. As Corey mentioned, find the right partner to work with you. So uh, we've worked with a number of partners. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're working really, really well with Apps Broker, who are, are here today. Um, and we've used them kind of across the board from actually giving some, some insight around uh, what experience they've had, had in other organizations, some of the architectural work, and then through to some of the delivery work and some of the analysis work. Engage your security team early. Engage your security team early is a massive learning for us. So we have um, iterated as we have gone along. So it's m very much an agile delivery process, not a waterfall process. And we didn't necessarily have all of the security artifacts in place from the get-go. And so we have had to form a really strong re working relationship with our um, enterprise architecture team and our security team. And they have been absolutely invaluable in, in helping keep the progress in our delivery. And that, I suppose, then leads on into upskilling your team. So although we have worked with partners, we have got incredible uh, people in our business, in our cloud team, in our delivery team, in our enterprise architecture team, and in our security teams. And by bringing them in to collaborate and work together on this project is what has been really, really successful. Um, but these are new technologies, and they're new technologies for us and for a number of our people. So we are upskilling and uptraining those people as we go along. Uh, we're doing some of that with our partners, and we're doing some of that specifically uh, training people up. Um, but that's invaluable, because actually, once those partners move on, then actually we need people in our business who are able to take these things forward and iterate it to the next level and get even more value from it in the future. So thank you for listening. I'm going to invite Corey and Christian back up on stage and, and invite some questions. You Thank you, Tom. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you do that. So um, we've got quite a bit of time. How are we doing? We've got about 15 minutes for questions. So um, for any of the three of us, so go ahead. Somebody in the front here first. Yep. Yeah, we got two microphones going around the room. Yep. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, I understand you successfully managed to migrate your data warehouse. And you briefly mentioned Data Studio. Uh, and I wonder, did your uh, analyst manage to switch their workloads and their visualization side of, of the job to these cloud-based solutions like Data Studio, Looker, or tool like, tools like that? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that one. So um, we, as we move more data into BigQuery, we're really trying to unlock uh, Data Studio for kind of quite simple, quite basic reporting and data visualization. Um, we haven't fully replaced our legacy data warehouses, so we haven't fully replaced our legacy data reporting and visualization tools. Um, where I think we will go with this is we will use Data Studio as the, um, as the main place people would go for reporting and visualization, recognizing that analysts may need another product or products as well, which probably go deeper. 
We looked uh, early this year at which products those might be, and we haven't fully selected one that we're going to go with. But one of the ones you mentioned, I mean, Looker's a good example of actually that would certainly be in the running, particularly as it's in the process of being bought by Google, but not, not quite there yet. Um, but that would certainly would be in the running. But we recognize that it will probably be different analytical tools or, or data visualization tools for slightly different use cases. Um, as Data Studio is part of the uh, general uh, Google products, we think we can get a lot of mileage out of it for lots of people within our business before then a subset of those people needing to use a more powerful analytics or visualization tool. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I suppose as with any other enterprise, um, we are in the situation where we have a mix of, I suppose, batched and streaming uh, data sources which we'd have to handle in this ecosystem. And there is this sort of lingering suspicion that streaming sources are sort of a second-class citizen on BigQuery. I mean, you'll have to pay for streaming inserts. Uh, streaming data is not available more or less on a real-time basis because BigQuery operates on this principle of uh, slots and so on. So, I mean, could you expand on that a little bit more to say, is, is streaming really going to become a first-class citizen given more and more of our sources are moving towards streaming. I think, uh, if I take yeah, that yeah. one, I guess. So um, I think there's, I'm going to move over here because I realize oh, I'm yes, out of the yes. light over there. Sorry. Um, so it's a very good question. And I think you've got to think about the ecosystem of data platforms as a whole within Google Cloud. And for some use cases, the more operational use cases, you may want to look at some more real-time engines, or you may want to look at BigQuery. And I think the. There are some changes that are in place, like the, uh, the BI engine and visualization tools that can accelerate real-time reporting. Um, but realistically, you need to find the right data storage media, the right structure for your data set for your workload. And as an example of that, we are doing more and more work to federate the data that is available in BigQuery out to other storage platforms. So you can already query Bigtable in BigQuery, for example. Um, and looking at extending that federation into a broader environment where you look at the appropriate storage technology, but BigQuery is still an analytics tool on top of that storage. So I think that's where we're going. That's the direction of travel, is more to look at the ecosystem of platform products. And if you look at the industry as a whole, we've moved from SQL and RB RDBMSs being the answer to everything to a more polyglot world over time. Now, that's caused silos, it's caused challenges, right? But being able to identify how to best use those different capabilities and those different polyglot storage media is part of a data analyst and a data architect's work now. And the GCP environment is no, uh, is no different to that. Does that help answer your question? Good. Yeah, I think, and I, just to jump in as well, uh, there's a lot of things on the BigQuery roadmap to improve functionality for streaming inserts and on that side of things. So just watch this space. The cloud moves incredibly quickly. It will get better. Yep. Anybody else? We've got one over here. Oh, yeah. Go on. Yep. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for that. Um, as you're doing your agile developments, how do you uh, deal with or uh, incentivize your product owners to actually handle technical debt and non-functional requirements <laughs> rather than just continually adding new features? That's a very good question, Tom. Uh, Are you talking yeah. about in John Lewis specifically or big query developers within Google? I'm talking about as you do a data migration sure. to a new data warehouse, not specifically within John Lewis, but I mean, if you've got insight as to how you you know, incentivize people to be good citizens and not just build yeah. up technical debt and yes. not ignore the governance and not just continually add new features? I'd say that's a challenge. I would say um, there's also something for us around getting some certainty around which particular version of encryption you're using or which particular version of, of some kind of third-party software solution you're using and getting some certainty around that. I think really for us it's around um, having rigorous delivery sprints and not allowing things to creep into those sprints um, that take us off our path. So it's, it's about having really clear goals, really clear vision, and actually keep them, keeping people really focused on that task. And if there is a decision that needs to be made about a new feature, um, a new capability, it, it comes through the right governance process. And, and we make a decision about, it, are we going to add value uh, to this project or this piece of work by adding that in now and potentially carrying forward a bit of technical debt? 
or is it best to, um, to, to keep things on track and deliver and then re reiterate at a later stage? Yeah. And Tom, sorry if I can jump mm -hmm. in as well. One of the things we're working with John Lewis on is uh, establishing a culture of SRE. So for those not uh, that haven't heard before, SRE, Site Reliability Engineering. Uh, it's Google's approach to DevOps. Uh, it is you know, establishing those SLOs and SLAs, so service level objectives, understanding what measures are important to your business, and tracking those and setting an error budget, and being able to you know, actually work with the product manager saying, no, actually, we're going to hold back this functionality, and I know you really want this functionality, but we're going to focus on system stability or upgrades or some of that some some of that technical debt that's so important to just stay on top of and i think if i could add one thing it's that agile is not a synonym for throw away the rules um, i think that one of the one of the challenges in adopting agile that he's seen is sometimes means oh you can do anything anything goes it's all cool right actually i'd argue the opposite is true in an agile development lifecycle, you've got more sprints, you've got a backlog building up, you need to develop governance that applies, you need to develop ground rules that enable your project delivery to continue. So as Corey said, KPIs, documentation, all of those things don't go away. In fact, they become more important because they're assets that you have to build out and understand probably across a broader um, group of your project team. So I think don't throw away the rules. Think about how that agile delivery will progress. And think about how to set out those guardrails to avoid scope creep, to avoid building up technical debt before you've even relinquished your role. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Anybody else? Some over this side, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon. I'm interested in hearing how you empowered um, people who might not be data analyst uh, professionals uh, in using the data that is available, BigQuery, Studio, um, to find the insight that they need for their job without systematically relying on the small team of data analysts. I would probably summarize that in demonstrating the art of the possible. So I think. Um, over a number of years, people become very understanding of how long it takes to extract some data from a system, or the fact the way they're going to receive it is going to be on a shared network drive or an access database or something like that. So I think people are quite conditioned to things being quite difficult, taking time, requiring uh, requests of the data team, then um, that being assessed in a, in a backlog, and then eventually some reporting or some, some value might, might come of that. I think people are so conditioned to that, I would say if you can demonstrate value very quickly to those end users, uh, once you've got data into something like BigQuery, you can very, very quickly gain some momentum in this is really powerful. So we've had a number of experiences where uh, people have been blown away by the fact that they can now access this data and it's now surfaced to them, and it is performant in a way that previously they didn't think was an option. And so what they previously would have done would go to a legacy database, go to a legacy reporting tool, export it into an Excel or a CSV file, and then work on that locally. If we were able to demonstrate, well, actually, you can come straight from BigQuery or some come straight from, a, from the, 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 the database of data warehouse into something like Google Data Studio, that's where I would really demonstrate the value. And, and it almost leans a little bit into that proof of concept model. If you can show people, um, then you can get, get momentum uh, and then get buy-in to do bigger and bigger proof of concepts and deliver more work. And I, th I think it's key to get the data analyst team on board early so that they can start identifying those use cases where actually they can say, go do it will give you the power to go do this. And, and they can then be some very strong advocates for those use cases. I think there's still a way to go. Um, but, but that's definitely the, the direction of travel that, that we've been seeing that works pretty well across a number of customers, actually. Uh, yeah. do, do you have any tips on uh, controlling the cost of using BigQuery? 
Uh, I was interesting to listen to the previous presentation in this room, which was focused on how do you manage cost in, in BigQuery. Um, I'll probably let one of my esteemed colleagues talk to that one in a bit more detail. It's certainly something that is on our mind, not only from the run costs once you've moved the data there and you then start to query it, and we're certainly very keen that the queries you run on it are effective or, or well-written uh, queries, so you're only querying the correct amount of data. So data gets loaded and partitioned appropriately, so you're managing that from a run perspective. But uh, there are also challenges around how do you predict what your storage and your run costs are going to be. So we've done um, a lot of analysis on how much data we're storing today, how much data we're going to move across, and then how much querying of that data we will be doing once it's in BigQuery to allow us to generate some uh, as-is and to-be run costs. Um, so it's something that you, you really have to do the analysis on and do the legwork on, on um, how much you query today and be mindful that in the future, um, if you're to get the benefit, actually, you're, you're m most likely going to be querying more and doing more data analysis, but most likely that's going to be the right thing to do if you're able to make smarter business decisions with that. Um, but you've got some points yeah. about how, you, how to control it. Yeah, so there's the, the two main cost areas for BigQuery. So storage, storage obviously, you, you pay for what you consume. Uh, then for uh, the querying, there's the flat rate uh, sorry, there's a, a flat rate reservations uh, as well as on demand. So on demand, you just pay for whatever query processing power you use. Uh, the flat rate, if you want to have that consistent, you know, predictable monthly fee, you can set a fat, flat rate reservation. Now, it used to be the buy-in for that was quite high, to be honest. You had to have quite a lot of usage of BigQuery for that to make sense. That's now dropped to, uh, a, we measure it by the slot, which is kind of a, a mix between CPU and memory. Uh, but that's now dropped to 500 slots. And actually, just launched this week is the Reservations API. So you can, oh, sorry, into beta, you can use the Reservations API to um, add additional capacity into your reservation on your own. So you can self-manage that. So, so the the cost and the threshold of that has come down quite significantly. It provides predictability, and you can self-manage. I think one last point on that is, in the context of a migration journey, don't forget where you came from. Um, it's, it's all very well saying you know, BigQuery will enable a whole load of things. But if you've actually identified KPIs, done some work up front, worked out what your query rate is in your existing data systems, and what your total cost of ownership in those systems are, when somebody comes a year later and starts beating you up and saying you're spending a lot more on BigQuery suddenly, you can say, yeah, but I'm still spending less than I was before, and this is a good place to be. Whereas if you didn't have that data up front, you've got nothing to measure against, so you're constantly battling why am I spending more rather than actually we're enabling more insights and we're still lower cost than we were previously. Obviously, as long as you can demonstrate that, right? Uh, but that's, that's one other way to look at this as well. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so probably no, two more questions. Well, yeah, probably two. One more one question. More. One more question. Over here. Yep, go for it. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I have a question for Corey. Uh, you mentioned that when you want to migrate your feeds, basically, you pick a use case. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you make your way. Uh, but there are many use cases that are built on top of some dodgy data feeds, and on top of those sit some dodgy scripts mm -hmm. that are creating some reports or a functionality. So my question is, how do you go about it? Like, do you throw everything away and build stuff from scratch, or? Yeah, it, it, it's and, and, and I laugh because we, as we were going through this, you know, you, you always find that use case that also then goes through a spreadsheet, which then goes through this team, which is then put into a pivot table, and then all of a sudden that's part of a critical process for some other team, and you're you're always going to find those. And I would really encourage you. This is a chance to refresh and you know and retool. Um, if time, if you don't have the time or the availability to invest in it, then you know, migrate as is as much as you can, but look to come back and renew that. It, it really is a, 
I hate to say once in a generation, but you, know, you, you don't get these sorts of refresh opportunities that often. So I would encourage you to take advantage. So, uh, I'm very aware of time. I'm afraid yeah. we have to call it, call it a day here. But um, we're going to probably wander over uh, probably to this side by the fence out there. Um, I think you'll all be leaving that way, actually. Thank you. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll be in great. that corner, and we'll be able to take a few questions personally questions. later. Can I also a plea? Um, please do leave some feedback using the app. Um, we, you we should be able to do that it. for all the sessions. And we do use it. We do all see it. And it does feed back into future events. So thank you very much thank for your you. time, everybody. Appreciate yeah. it.